The Ancient Kingdoms of Peru by Nigel Davies Chapter 1 The Birth of Civilization A Land of Contrasts Peru is a land of sharp contrasts. From north to south, a flat strip of desert borders the Pacific Ocean, so arid that it supports no visible form of plant life. However, this wasteland is intersected by many rivers whose green and fertile valleys present a marked con contrast to the long stretches of desert sand. The Pacific Ocean itself, due to the Humboldt Current, is much colder on the coast of Peru than most waters of comparable latitudes in other parts of the world. As a result, though rainfall is a scant phenomenon, the sky is at times cloudy, particularly in the vicinity of the present-day capital, Lima, where a strong sun beats on the cold sea and causes vapor to rise and form clouds. In marked contrast to the coastal strip, a few miles to the east rises the majestic range of the Andes that stretches southwards into Chile. Part of the central area of Peru is uncultivable since it consists of rocky, snow-clad peaks. However, between these mountains, which in effect form two parallel ranges, lie many fertile valleys. Located at altitudes of between 2,500 and 3,500 meters, these enjoy a regular rainfall during the summer months and support a wide range of plant and animal life. As an example, one may cite the valley of Cusco, the future Inca capital, with an average elevation of 3,500 meters. Among the highest and most exotic valleys situated at the southeastern extremity of Peru is the basin in which lies Lake Titicaca, the highest navigable water in the world. As we shall later see, this region played an important role in the history of ancient times. Beyond the Andes lies a third region which embraces over half of the total area of modern Peru, known as the Montañas. It consists of lush lowlands, whose northern extremity forms part of the Great Basin of the Amazon River. This region was the home of peoples whose contacts with the more advanced cultures of the Andean valleys were somewhat limited, though Inca sources mention various rather inconclusive military campaigns against lowland tribes. The date of the arrival of human beings in Peru and its neighbors remains somewhat controversial. Scholars now generally agree that a human presence in the Andean region occurred before 9000 BC. Earlier radiocarbon dates, such as those of Richard McNeish, indicating a human occupation of the valley of Ayachuco before 20,000 BC, are not universally accepted. These early Peruvians were clearly descended from small groups of people who had first colonized the New World after crossing from Asia into in the region of the Bering Strait. At a time when a land bridge between Asia and America still existed, at least one of these groups eventually crossed the Isthmus of Panama and thereby became the ancestors of the Andean peoples. These early settlers followed a, the fairly typical pattern of hunter-gatherers. For, for instance, Michael Mosley writes of sites belonging to what is known as the Paihan tra tradition, yielding radiocarbon dates of before 8000 BC. Finds have been made of stone quarries and lithic workshops at La Cumbre on the north side of the Rio Moche Valley, a, re a region which, as we shall later see, played a major role in the history of ancient Peru. Places located at higher altitudes seem to have been also occupied at this time. For instance, one may cite the excavations of Pachamachai Cave, situated inland at an elevation of 4,300 meters and occupied by hunter-gatherers who preyed upon the various camelloid species which abounded in the region. These hunter-gatherers attained the next step on the road to civilization, the cultivation of plants, both for food as well as for the making of mats and containers. Dates of 8,000 BC exist for both Guitarero Cave, relatively near the coast, and for the Tres Ventanas Caves, situated further inland at an altitude of, 30, of 3,900 meters. Fragments of cultivated gourd have been found of comparable antiquity in the Ayacucho region. As early as about 6,000 BC, evidence survives of small villages on the northern coast of Peru, and at one site, Nanchoc, twin mounds have been excavated that appear to constitute a primitive form of ceremonial construction. For truly monumental architecture, generally taken to indicate the presence of a more complex society, 
we have radiocarbon dates of between 2900 and 2700 BC for the site of Aspero, situated on the coast to the north of Lima. A sample from a nearby platform mound of the Huaca de los Idolos provided a date of 3000 BC. Unexpected Discoveries Aspero, first taken to consist merely of natural mounds, was first excavated in 1941 by Gordon Woolley and John Corbett. As they were fully aware, the presence of some form of pottery was then reg regarded as a universal characteristic of even the earliest monumental architecture throughout the world. Undeterred by the apparent lack of ceramics at Aspero, they therefore proceeded to offer a comparatively late date for the site, based on pottery none of which was found at Aspero itself, but in, in a nearby cemetery. Only about two decades later was the wholly astonishing fact reluctantly accepted that not only did Aspero indeed have no pottery, but that it formed part of an extensive architectural pattern. This included a number of monumental pre-ceramic sites such as El, Par El Paraiso in the Rio Chilon Valley, and above all the highland site of Kotosh, much further inland, where archaeologists of the University of Tokyo investigated large structures of many kinds in different layers all of which lack pottery. These pre-ceramic sites of Peru are among the oldest forms of monumental architecture in the New World. The earliest are contemporary with the great pyramids of the Old Kingdom in Egypt. To take one example of this period, major excavations at, As at Aspero excuse me, revealed a series of, of mounds that were not simply earthen platforms, but whose successive phases consisted of walled rooms. These stone walls were plastered and some were painted red or yellow. In the Huaca de los Idolos, the largest platform mound at Aspero, an elaborate pattern of a room survives, with walls that contain niches. In the Huaca de los Sacrificios at Aspero, a ceremonial burial of an infant was found, wrapped in textiles and surrounded by grave goods. Some were made of exotic materials such as colored feathers, stone beads, and even spondylus shells that must have been bought, brought over from Ecuador. One outstanding characteristic of these ruins that continued into the subsequent ceramic phase is the presence of sunken courts, particularly in sites on the coast. In the more typical examples of such sites, an independent rectangular platform is built with stairs that lead down to a circular court, gener generally situated within a rectangular forecourt. For instance, at Salinas de Chao, a large site on the shoreline of the Rio Chao Valley, a terrace platform 40 meters wide had three flights of stairs that led to a circular plaza with painted walls. An estimated 100,000 tons of stones were used in its cons construction. The principal form of visual art in these pre-ceramic sites was that of cotton textiles. Motifs included two-headed snakes and stylized birds that form antecedents for art styles of later Peruvian cultures. Another major pre-ceramic site is the highland settlement of La Galgada, where some of the earliest vestiges of irrigation were found. While grave goods in the form of, of pottery are obviously lacking, elaborate burials contain beaded necklaces, and many individuals were already buried with textiles and cotton bags with complex designs. La Galgada had two major mounds. The larger of the two was over 15 meters high. A succession of chambers with central fire pits were built on the summit. Unlike other contemporary sites, archaeologists have located the remains of, of human dwellings in the vicinity. Fifty rustic buildings are recognizable as houses rather than temples. During the pre-ceramic phase, the first so-called U-shaped design of ceremonial buildings also appeared. As an example, one may cite the layout of El Paraiso, near the mouth of the Rio Chilon. The largest of all the pre-ceramic sites, it foreshadows the subsequent U-shaped complexes of the second millennium. Further Surprises What is currently called the Initial Period traditionally begins not with the dates of the great pre-ceramic sites named above, but with later dates that derive from the first introduction of pottery in about 1800 BC. The unearthing of sites built long before this date had been quite unexpected. At the time of the 1941 excavations at Aspero, the Peruvian archaeologist Julio Tello continued to advance the, the notion that this and other sites were Chavanoid, 
and somehow influenced by the great center of Chavin, still then held to be the oldest of all the known sites of Peru, serving as the cultural inspiration of all early monuments. Since Chavin was then currently regarded as the very first civilization in Peru, its people were compared with the Sumerians of Mesopotamia or the Olmecs in Mexico. John Rowe, as late as 1962, defined the early horizon as beginning with the introduction of Chavin influence into Ica, a small valley on the south coast of Peru. Having drawn such seemingly obvious conclusions arising from, st from studies of earlier civilizations, or, or rather, arising from studies of other early civilizations, archaeologists were confronted with yet another surprise, which conclusively reversed their original findings. On the basis of radiocarbon dating, it eventually became clear that Chavin, far from being the first of these early per Peruvian centers, is the last and dates from about 800 BC, or about 1,000 years la later than the earliest Peruvian pottery. Traditionally regarded as the originator of early Peruvian fine arts and monumental architecture, Chavin is now seen as the successor rather than the precursor of the earlier ceremonial centers basic to Andean civilization. Moreover, it is now in effect realized that Chavin, which is, def which is defined as belonging to the early horizon, was preceded by not one but two previous cultural phases, first by the pre-ceramic era, including centers that date from as early as 3000 BC, and thereafter by a second era, now generally termed the Initial Period, which lasted from about 1800 to 800 BC. To this second phase, many sites belong which, al which already produced pottery, and in which two forms of ceremonial architecture continue to prevail, the, the circular sunken courts and the U-shaped mound complexes. The discovery of the fact that the imposing site of Chavin de Huantar far from being the originator of art and architecture in Peru, dates from after, not before, many of the early ceremonial centers, has, revolu has revolutionized our notions as to the origins of Andean civilization. The Initial Period To this era, defined as beginning in about 1800 BC, belongs a plethora of imposing sites. It is marked not only by the production of the earliest ceramics, but by new farming techniques, in particular, the development of irrigation, which led to the establishment of larger settlements in the coastal desert, and to the growth of more complex centers of population, both on the coast and in the highlands, where monumental architecture became quite widespread. Among the most impressive examples of the m many sites of the initial period are those of the Sechin complex in the Rio Cosma Valley. Of these, Cerro Sechin is probably the best known. During the latter part of the initial period, this site covered five hectares. Consisting basically of a three-tiered step platform, its outer wall was adorned with nearly 400 stone carvings. To cite Richard Berger's description, these stone sculptures, made from granite blocks quarried from a nearby hill, were arranged in the platform wall to portray a single scene in which two columns of warriors approach each other from opposing sides amidst the carnage of their adversaries. The figures depicted on these sculptured stones represent humans rather than animals. Victorious warriors are shown only on the largest stones, arrayed in flowing loincloths. More frequent is the portrayal of the defeated, always naked. Nude bodies are shown with eyes bulging and torsos often sliced in two. About 70% of the carvings show decapitated heads, usually with eyes closed, ready to be used as trophies. Berger suggests that Cerro Sechin, sometimes interpreted as a kind of war memorial, is simply another example of ceremonial architecture decorated with religious themes. Perhaps they represent some mythical battle won by ancestral heroes. The largest of the sites of the Cosma region is Sechin Alto, only two kilometers distant from Cerro Sechin. The principal mound, measuring 250 by 300 meters at its base, is probably the largest single building cons constructed in the New World during the second millennium BC. Though due to much looting, it is less well preserved than Cerro Sechin. It formed part of a large ceremonial complex, 
Four huge rectangular plazas stretch out from the central mound, three of which have sunken circular courts in their center. The Sechin complex, a striking example of building during the initial period, is but one of a large number of surviving monuments of that epoch, both on the coast and inland. Not only were large sites situated further to the north, such as Huaca de los Reyes, located 25 kilometers inland. Others exist in the vicinity of Lima, for instance, La Florida, which dates from about 1710 BC and is estimated to have required some 7 million mandates to construct. Highland sites of the initial period survive as far distant as Chiripa on the shore of Lake Titicaca. The more northerly sites of this period, such as Huaca de, de los Reyes, share a common religious tradition of art and architecture known as Cupisnique, notable for its pottery and above all for its peculiar adobe sculpted figures. To cite one example, when the site of Huaca de los Reyes was excavated, fine adobe sculptures came to light, including giant three-dimensional feline heads with snarling faces and huge clenched teeth. Javin The phase, defined as the in initial period, drew to an end in about 800 BC. During the following period, known as the Early Horizon, inland sites, particularly Chavin, rose to prominence. Chavin de Huantar, situated to the northwest of Kotosh, is located at an altitude of 3,150 meters. It stands roughly halfway between the Pacific Ocean and the tropical forest. According to Richard Berger, who has written at length on Chavin, it was founded in about the year 900 BC. The rise of this very important site coincides with the gradual collapse of the U-shaped centers of the coast, a process which was more or less completed by 500 BC. In the earlier Chivin period, known as the Urabariu phase, estimated to have lasted until about 500 BC, the Chavin Old Temple was built. To the final phase, known as Hanav Hanabariu, which ended in about 200 BC, belongs the completion of the new temple. By this time, the population of Chavin had greatly expanded and its pottery was the object of long-distance exchange. The quality and sophistication of the metallurgy, textiles, and ceramics found both on the site itself and in an extensive re region where Chavin influence is present suggests that they were the work of specialized artists. Metallurgy was at that time in its infancy. Small pieces of hammered copper sheet have been found at the site of Mina Perdida, probably made a little before 1000 BC. However, it now seems clear that the spread of Chavin culture, both on the coast and in the highlands, was far from universal. For instance, the valley of Cusco, the future Inca capital, is now seen as having had much stronger ties with the fairly complex societies that were developing around Lake Titicaca than with Chavin. The earliest part of the Chavin complex, usually described as the Old Temple, was like the centers already described above, a U-shaped platform enclosing a sunken circular courtyard. On the exterior stone walls at approximately 10 meters from the ground stood a series of animal and human stone heads, displaying contorted features and crude fangs. Their size is more than double that of ordinary human heads. An unusual characteristic of this temple is the number of interior galleries, built at different levels and connected by, st by stairways. In some galleries, traces of slabs survive, decorated with incised and painted figures. Others contain fine ceramics. At the point where the two arms of the lower gallery cross is an imposing stella, known as El Lanzon, thus named by the archaeologist Julio Teo. Because of its lance-like form, Berger considers that it represented the supreme deity of Chavin. Another gallery, known as the Gallery of Offerings, contains a remarkable collection of pottery with motifs that recall Kupisnike models. Apart from their usage as, st as storage space, it has been su suggested that the galleries house priests or initiates. The old temple belongs to the early Ubariu phase of the Chavin culture. Probably during the first part of the following phase, known as Chakinani, the construction of the new temple began. This remodeling of the original structure transformed the right arm of the older U-shaped building into a massive pyramid. As a result of this reconstruction, the new temple became part of a complex of large, sunken rectangular courtyards. 
The new temple represented the form of Chavin architecture that spread through much of the central Andes and even influenced the architecture of Tiahuanaco, situated on Lake Titicaca in Bolivia. While, as we have seen, many of the principal sites of the initial period collapsed, the rise of Chavin in the early horizon was paralleled by other major centers. One may cite as an example Pacupampa, another inland site lying to the north of Ch Chavin, where a, a massive subterranean plaza contains carved columns and lintels typical of, of this period. At Kunturwasi, also situated to the north of Chavin in the Rio Hecatepeque Valley, the staircases of the central plaza were decorated with stone carvings similar to those of Chavin itself. Other sites, such as Kotosh, already prominent in the initial period, survived and new, const new constructions were added that were reminiscent of the Chavin style. Ever since the earliest studies of Chavin were made, its influence has been viewed as the expression of some kind of religious ideology. The famous Ramandi stone found in the new temple continues to reflect certain themes already present in the Elan stone shaft of the old temple, including the fangs so typical of the Chavin deity. Such fangs are also a feature of the famous Tello obelisk, which represents a kind of supernatural caiman, though not all its traits are drawn from the, from the caiman, an aquatic predator. The tail is not crocodilian, but presents the features of an eagle or hawk. Along with the jaguar, not only the caiman, but also the crested eagle and the, and the serpent were among the most common themes in Chavin art. The rather enigmatic Chavin religious cults found in many regions was originally thought to be centered upon a purely feline god. But this view has now been modified. The feline god was certainly important in Chavin cosmology, as depicted, for instance, on some of the sculptures of the old temple. A curious feature of Chavin religious imagery is the presence of lowland crops that cannot be grown at the altitude of Chavin, such as manioc, bottle gourd, and hot peppers. This has given rise to suggestions that its first settlers had migrated to Chavin from the Amazon or Orinoco basins. Moreover, the development of the basic ideology of the Chavin peri period would have been hard to define in precise terms since certain art forms traditionally described as Chavinoid predate the earliest remains of the site of Chavin itself. While the iconography of Chavin is unquestionably defined in the fine stonework in Chavin itself, there is no evidence that large stone objects were made for export. The extent of its influence can better be defined by the presence in other sites of Chavin ceramics and textiles, both utilitarian and religious. The extensive spread of the Chavin cult is exemplified by the site of Karwa, whose cemetery, situated 8 kilometers south of the Paracas necropolis, was first discovered by looters. Over 200 fragments of decorated Chavin-style textiles were recovered, together with a small number of shards also as associated with those textiles. Spears of Influence On the basis of evidence now available, it must be admitted that Chavin cultural influence was less universal than Tello had originally proposed. For instance, the Chanapata culture, situated in the valley of Cusco, was one of many groups that also maintained strong links with the peoples of the Lake Titicaca Basin, where complex societies were already developing. Impressive temples had been erected in this area before 600 BC, but their stone image images were unrelated to Chavin art. As Richard Berger points out, the centers of the Chavin horizon, their massive structures decor decorated with detailed stone sculptures, were the product of a complex society and a well-established system of social stratification. Specific elements of Chavin civilization can be traced back as far as the pre-ceramic era. In other respects, Chavin inherited basic features of Andean culture, such as the role of textiles as the highest art form in the production of fine gold and silver objects. Many centuries later, as we shall see, the people of Moche revived Chavin motifs in their ceramics, while the people of Tiwanaco began to worship a staff god similar to the image on the Raimondi stone, a deity whose cult was to become widespread throughout the Peruvian highlands. This concludes chapter 1.